Hello coaches! Welcome back to another episode of Coach Better from Eduro Learning. In this episode, we're chatting with Jabiz Rizdana, head of grade 8 and middle school English teacher at United World College Southeast Asia in Singapore. As an experienced classroom teacher, digital literacy coach, and school leader, Jabiz shares his perspectives about building a successful coaching relationship. Jabiz highlights the importance of viewing your colleagues as human beings first and the need for coaches to adapt and adjust for each individual teacher, just like we would for students. The strong coaching culture established at UWC that Jabiz describes provides a great foundation for what coaching can be. So there are lots of great takeaways for teachers, coaches, and school leaders. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Clint Hamada. And my name is Kim Cafino, and we're your hosts for this series. Between the two of us, we have almost 40 years of coaching experience in schools around the world, and we want to help you coach better. So whether you're already a coach or you're just getting started, we're passionate about helping you take that next step in your coaching journey by sharing thoughtful, professional conversations about coaching and learning with experts from around the world. And you might notice that Clint and I are never in the same room. That's because I live in Bangkok and Clint lives in Beijing. But we are so excited to get together every week to share and discuss how we can all coach better together. If you enjoy any part of this episode, please make sure you give it the old thumbs up. It really does help us to know what you want to hear more about. Also, subscribe to the channel so you can see all of the coaching videos and click on the notifications bell so you know as soon as each video gets posted. Please make sure to watch all the way to the end. We've got some great opportunities for your professional learning that we think you'll love. Let's get started. All right, welcome to our Coach Better YouTube series. Uh, Clint and I are here today with Javiz Rizdana from United World College Southeast Asia, and we're super excited to talk about coaching from the perspective of a teacher. Javiz, can you start out and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your education experience? Yeah, so as Kim said, my name is Jabiz Rezdana. I've been teaching internationally since 2004, which I guess is a pretty long time, about 14 years. I've uh, been at a bunch of different schools in the region, started off in uh, Malaysia, Doha, Indonesia, and now I've been at UWC for the last seven years. This is our seventh year. Um, I've had a variety of different roles from teaching EAL in the primary school to a digital literacy coach to kind of my comfort zone, which is teaching English in the middle school, six through eight. And I have been head of grade, which is kind of a leadership role for me for the last two years. And this is my third year as head of grade eight at UWC. And I just want to throw in there that I'm proud that Jabiz and I worked together in Malaysia from, two, what was that, 2005 to 2007-ish? So, yeah. Yeah. Way back so, like, in the day. A long time ago. <laughs> and here we are together again. The birth of Skype, or like it was the beginning of Wikispaces, like it was all when everything was brand new. Oh yeah, blogging, all that stuff was taken off when we were working together. So, super cool. So in, that, in your various roles in all those different schools, and you've also had the role of being a coach, in your perspective, particularly as a teacher, but you know, bringing all that stuff, what do you think coaches do? What is their role in a school? Um, I think they have a variety of different roles, depending on what kind of coach they are and who they're coaching. Um, but our former uh, head of school, James DeLeo, kind of put it best. I think the metaphor was this idea of teachers as craftspeople and how you're constantly kind of working on your craft. And I believe a coach is just someone that is a sounding board and a mirror. And I mean, it sounds redundant, but as someone who coaches you through that improvement of your craft. So you don't feel like you're working in isolation and you have someone who is there alongside you um, maybe seeing things that you don't see and guiding you to hone your craft as an educator, as a teacher. So at your current school at UWC, what, what sort of uh, coaches do you work with? I know there, there's a digital literacy coach team. Do you have other uh, like instructional coaches that you guys work with to help you hone that craft? Yeah, so I actually work with two coaches currently. So one is our digital literacy coach. And I am a tech mentor, so we're working on various tech projects that are not indefinite, but kind of work throughout the year. And so I meet with her probably once every two weeks and kind of have a project that we're working on. Um, she kind of checks in and gives me tips on that and coaches me through that process. And then we also have a literacy coach in the middle school who works with all the English teachers. Uh, she's actually branching out to work with humanities and science as well. 
we are a reading and writing workshop from TC. So it really started from kind of understanding that pedagogy. But now that we've been working with her for a couple of years, and we've all kind of just um, kind of absorbed how that works, now we're just working on individual craft practices. So with her, currently I'm working on creating kind of online blended learning videos that help uh, students who are maybe on the lower end or the higher end of my teaching so they can independently go um, to those resources and so she's helping me do that last year we worked on conferencing how to make my uh, conferences more effective um, but again she kind of comes in and says what is it that you want to work on what's the, the craft move that you're interested in and helps me brainstorm and then we design a plan and how often we meet and then she kind of coaches me through that and she does that with all of our English teachers throughout the year. Right. And I think it's an interesting overlap, you know, the, what you were just saying about your literacy coach and how, you know, she's helping you design blended learning environments to support, basically to differentiate in your classroom and to support those students and the, so they have some ownership in, in what and when they're learning. Um, I think in a lot of schools that might fall in the hands of their tech coaches or their digital literacy coaches or whatever they're called in, in those different schools. So I, I like how those two roles seem to overlap for you and, um, you know, it gives you. It comes from me, right? Because last year my kind of coaching cycle wasn't around anything to do with blended learning or teaching. Right. All my conferences were really not the way I wanted them to be. And so I focused on that. Whereas this year, this feels like something I'm excited about and pretty passionate about. And it is kind of a two birds with one stone type thing. So I'm kind of working on that stuff with uh, our digital literacy coach as well. It just makes sense to kind of get two different people helping you do it. I think it's also cool that the way that you work with those diff two different coaches is very similar. It sounds like there's a culture of, like you were talking before about James Delal, that there's a culture of teachers are always working to improve and hone their craft and coaches are there to support you. <clears throat> so their role is really just to see what is it you wanna do in your next step. So when you think about how you work with coaches at your school, it's really primarily because there's that culture of coaching regardless of which kind of coach it is. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that stems from some of the work we've done with adaptive schools and cognitive coaching. So I would say, you know, this is going to be on the internet, but I'll say it anyway, like a couple of years ago when it first came, there was this kind of eye rolling of, oh God, everyone's going to be a coach and coaching each other. And the joke of, you know, just paraphrasing what people say and, you know, are you coaching me now and stuff like that. But I think after a couple of years, it's just settled now. And there are enough people understand it enough to know that it wasn't kind of a shtick and that any teacher can be a coach for any teacher at any given time if we have the basic tools of kind of how that works. Um, and that's been really, really helpful. So you're not being kind of like surprise coach, but you're seeking it out and saying, hey, you know what, this is something I'm working on or dealing with and I think you'd be the right person um, to coach me through it or vice versa. Like I know a lot of people are saying, hey, I want to practice these coaching skills and I want to get better at it. So, you know, with our professional relationship, could this be an opportunity for me to practice these skills? And so it's definitely embedded in our culture and everything we do. And thinking about how those coaches are working with you, you know, one of the things that you highlighted with your literacy coaches, you know, this is something that you have, have said that you want to do. And I think in any coaching relationship, that has to be first and foremost, right? It's not something, coaching isn't something that is done to the teacher. Coaching is something that the teacher approaches with a mindset of, hey, this is something that I want to improve in my practice, or this is something that I, you know, I'm curious about. Can you come and help me do that? And I think what, we'll maybe jump a little bit ahead. I think that is part of that coaching culture and how you build that is, is, you know, vital to the success of any of those initiatives. Um, and, and I, you talking about the kind of that eye roll of the paraphrasing, um, you know, every, every person who's ever been paraphrased or has ever been taught the, the, the skill of paraphrasing, you know, you do that for maybe the first six months and then it's funny how it just becomes part of your natural pattern of, of conversation. Um, and then it does become enculturated into, into your, your meetings or into your, your, just your everyday chats in the lunchroom, which I think is, is kind of cool. Yeah. And I think the, the key part that makes it successful is it doesn't come from like the coach isn't coming with an agenda. Right? It's not an evaluative system of like supervision and evaluation where 
you're working from a deficit model where someone, you know, is in a support cycle and needs help. And so they're, they're feeling like they're being coached because they lack something. And I'm sure that does happen in certain places and certain schools. And there is definitely a purpose and necessity for that as well. But I think the conversation we're having about coaching is much more the, the coachee is initiating and setting the agenda. And that could be really powerful. Mm. So I have one side question and then I want to move us on to the next like bigger question. Would you say generally speaking in your school that most people are open and receptive to coaching and there aren't like resistors? Now I'm just um, curious. Yeah. I mean, I can only speak for the middle school with any degree of knowledge because I don't really know how it works. I know it's a K through 12 initiative for sure. Um, but I would say definitely on the teams that I'm involved in, whether it's the English team or the as had a grade the grade level team I work with people are very very open but I would say on the majority in the middle school that yes there's a little bit of that still kind of what Clint was saying that cynicism about it just being tokenism but I think when people push comes to shove and you kind of ask them to do it and it becomes a positive experience that's spreading and people are realizing that it's actually beneficial to them and I would say in our school the culture definitely is one of we want to get better um, and so if this is a tool that helps us get better, then people are all for it. Cool. So thinking about this from a teacher perspective, perhaps not in such a great coaching culture that you already have at your school, what are some good opportunities for coaches to work with you? Like when do you want coaches to support you and what are some ways they can come and work with you if they don't have this already kind of existing culture that you're describing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it's, it's almost like students, right? If there's kind of a set of expectations within your department or your team, almost like a rubric. Like I think one thing that our literacy coach brought in was this, this rubric she created about like, you know, these are the things that are good when you're conferencing, these are good things that you should be doing. When you're doing your mini lesson, these are things you should be thinking about. And on the rubric, you can pretty clearly see kind of where you fall. And for me, that was kind of an eye-opening thing because on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, teachers kind of survive and do what they need to do to teach pretty good classes and all of us can be mediocre for a long time, <laughs> you know, and just kind of survive. And it's like, this is the way I teach and things are going well for the most part. But then when you kind of look at it and go, actually, you know what, like mediocre gets me by, but I'm not doing that. And if I know that's kind of an expectation or that's something I could be doing and it's kind of like a rubric for kids, that seems to be pretty effective. And again, not in a way of, oh my God, look, I'm not doing anything. I'm a terrible teacher, but being honest with yourself of where you are and kind of where you want to get better. Because I think most teachers are pretty honest with themselves and realize that they run on survival mode sometimes, and then sometimes they run on let's, let's get better. I think it's really refreshing to hear a veteran teacher. I mean, 14, 15 years overseas, right? Who is able to kind of look up and go, there are things that I want to improve. And I, I like, really like that idea of that rubric for coaching. You know, what, what is something, if I'm a literacy coach or if I'm a math coach or if I'm a tech coach, you know, what are some of the things that, that we think are, that all teachers should be thinking about and, and think, trying or bringing into their classes? And, you know, you can't bring all aspects of those in at all times. Um, I think if you're doing something like the Reader's Writer's Workshop, you know, there are certain steps in the process that you could be like, hey, conferencing or feedback or things like that. Um, but, you know, so many initiatives that schools have, in, have brought in and that are, that are talking about, you know, you can bring in these rubrics and start thinking about, okay, well, for Initiative X, you know, it could look like this, three different stages, you know, where might you put yourself on that stage and how might I help you get to the next stage? Um, it's just a really, hopefully non-threatening question that, that, coaches can ask of teachers and, you know, and just let me know how I can help in any, any one of these stages. Um, I, I think it's great. Sometimes veteran teachers think, oh, you know, I've been in this a long time. I know what I'm doing. The thing that we say works for kids. It's basically what we do with students, right? And right. So the word threatening. I mean, I don't think any teacher would ever, well, hopefully isn't using a rubric in a threatening way when you're interacting with students. Right? And, One hopes. Yeah. Then you shouldn't be threatened by a rubric when you're looking at your own practice. So, and like you said, they don't have to be these detailed, elaborate, step-by-step -step kind of evaluative documents, but just something that says, hey, this is kind of what it looks like, where do you want to be? Um, I don't know if this is the right part of the conversation, but also just 
putting myself in kind of a coach's shoes for a little bit as kind of head of grade. One of the things we're trying to do is like during our mentor time, which is our kind of homeroom system, for years we've been saying, we know what a good mentor should be. We know what a good mentor classroom should look like, but there's been very little accountability or coaching or how do we know that, right? Like everyone kind of wings it and it's successful, but it's not, you know, we're not really teaching and assessing in any formal way. So one of the things I'm trying to initiate is kind of creating that rubric with the team, with the teachers and saying, hey, listen, we've all said this is what it looks like. So let's name it and let's create that rubric together and then use that rubric to then kind of go through coaching cycles of, you know, we'll come in and we'll observe and do things like looking for learning and then take that data and then I can coach you based on that data. Right. So mm -hmm. I think giving teachers ownership of the rubric is also a powerful way that it becomes less threatening. And it's, yeah, like we negotiated what the things we want to do. Let's gather data on what that looks like. And then let's find a way to, you know, I'm not going to tell you what you need to do to be a better mentor because you know better than I do. So let me coach you to figure out what are the things you need to do to move forward. Okay, so I love both of those things, but I want to come back to one point that I really appreciate a lot of, you were talking about teachers often operate on survival mode. This is like a few points ago. Teachers yeah. often operate on survival mode, so they don't even sometimes realize what they could be doing better because they're just like, it's working okay, I'm just going to get through this day. So I, one message that comes back to me every time I work with schools, individuals, is like teachers don't know what they don't know. And so providing them with that rubric of guidance so that they can actually see, oh, this is what's possible. This is why the coach has been like loitering around my classroom for the last few weeks. It's because, you know, this is something, you know, we could actually do and this is a way I could move forward. So I think to, for me personally, as a coach, that's an important point to remember is that we don't know what we don't know and finding a variety of ways to share that with teachers that is non-threatening, like you describe, I think can be a very powerful way to kind of open that door to a coaching conversation. So I really appreciate that. And then I love your, sorry, go ahead. You want to say no, I was just to say on that note too, going back to the idea of how we talk to kids, I think demystifying this notion of like the master teacher, right? And you're going to do everything perfect and everything's going to be on this side of the rubric. And it's like, why would I even you know, either I'm early in my career or I'm tired or I'm on survival mode. I can't do all that stuff. I just want to get through the day. It could just be one thing, you know, and mm -hmm. really recognizing what's the next step of that one thing and having a timeline of, you know what, I'm going to work on this for a couple of weeks and see how it goes. Um, just like we tell kids, you're not going to be great and perfect at every single thing uh, on the rubric, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to take one step forward to try to get better at one, one part of your craft. Yes. And I'm still coming back to my other point because I do want to highlight, I love your story about um, working with your grade level teachers to design the rubric together. And just thinking about how powerful that would be to come up with what we think good teaching and learning, in your case, you're about being a good mentor, but what we think that looks like together and then having somebody to support me to get to that goal. Like that just sounds like such a Team, great team building and like empowering environment to work in. So I love the application that you took the rubric from the literacy coach, that kind of concept, and now you're bringing it into your responsibility as a coach and a leader as head of grades. I think that's really cool. But the reality of that, like, you know, I was super gung-ho about it because I kind of took a course this summer and it was my project and I wrote it all up. And then when I came to like present it to my team, we didn't have time, like the meetings were late. And I, you know, I was supposed to start in August and now here we are in October. And when I felt the kind of pulse of my team, I could automatically feel that this wasn't gonna be, they weren't as excited about it as I was because they had so many other things on their plate. So I just kind of took volunteers. I was like, listen, why don't we just start with whoever is interested? And I got two people. And so we're gonna start that rubric process with the two and then take that information to the rest of the team for kind of validation. So there is that sense if you can't always, that level of excitement isn't always gonna be there because mm -hmm. the reality of schools isn't always that. So you start small with what you have and you kind of build. So whatever end I think of the coaching conversation you're on, I think it's important for coaches to also realize that, that sometimes you work with who you have and what you have to build small and then go from there as opposed to 
you know, we're gonna get the whole eighth grade to design this rubric and then we're gonna do this crazy plan that <laughs> I thought of, but no one else is really excited about. Listen, so, you are um, definitely talking to two people who understand exactly yeah. that. Like, oh, we got you. <laughs> Find your cheerleaders. Yes. Yeah. So you were talking a little bit earlier about kind of the coaching cycles that you're in at the moment with, with your different coaches. Um, it sounds like there may be I don't, I don't know. I, I think UWC is a pretty big place. Your literacy coach is working with a pretty large English department, for example. And then you say she's branching out into like science and humanities. She's got a lot on her plate. What do you do as a teacher when you feel like you are really in need of a coach, but maybe you just don't have access to that literacy coach because, you know, her, her dance card is full or his dance card is full for the next X weeks. Like what is your strategy to, to continue in some of those coaching relationships maybe, or to, I don't know, how do you deal with that when you don't have that direct access like you would hope that you would have? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, for me personally, I think because the way I'm using those coaching cycles aren't kind of like, like a survival thing. Like I think if you're a new teacher and you're in a new school and you're trying to learn new things, you kind of feel like you need someone on your side a little bit. Again, using coach is like a sports metaphor, right? Like if you're the rookie on the team, you definitely need that feedback from the coach and you need that kind of support. But when you've been on the team for a while, for seven years, you're kind of, you don't need that constant support. Um, and we have a pretty veteran team that's been together. Like our English team has been together for almost seven years. And I know that any one of them is a pretty amazing, I can go to them with anything. Right. And we're kind of, you know, it's kind of crazy. After every class, we like run to each other's rooms <laughs> They're like, how did that go? Like, what'd you do? Oh my God, that was the worst. Like, I can't believe we thought that was going to be good. Or, and so we have that day-to-day -day kind of just rapport as well, which is really, really important. So I think fostering that sense of camaraderie and rapport within a team is really important work for the coach to do because then they feel like, you know, we can go play this game without the coach. Like, we know, we know how to do it. And especially if you have some of those kind of veteran people on the team that seems to help a lot. So personally, I don't know. I don't think I can answer that question. I never feel like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I need my coach. Um, but I've been doing this for a long time. But I think, I think you have answered the question to my, you know, from my perspective, because, you know, your, your colleagues are your coaches. You, you know, like you said, you don't, need, you don't need the coach to play the game. You know, the coach gives you a, a very important perspective, but there are other people who are there with you in the classrooms who can also, um, you can lean on. And you feel like you have that trust and that camaraderie and that rapport with them and sort of that vulnerability to, to lean on them. And it sounds like you do a lot of co-planning, right? So it's like, oh, yeah, we're doing the, you know, we're kind of working on the same thing right now. How to go for you? Did this work? Did that work? And I think, you know, sometimes as teachers, classroom teachers might forget that. Like your head of department or your neighbor next door, they can also sometimes fulfill that coaching role if, if, if that's what you need. Yeah, I mean, the, like I said, I was taking a course this summer, and I know different people have such different realities, right? And sometimes you don't realize kind of how blessed you are with the situation you have until you talk to other people. But yeah, we have common planning time. We meet once a week. Like I said, we've had a team that's been together that's relatively small, the same group of people for seven years. And, you know, the way you operate in a team like that is very different than if every other year someone's coming and going and stuff like that. So that common planning and kind of knowing what's happening though. That's kind of, again, that's kind of the way we operate on a day-to-day -day basis, but also that larger kind of meta umbrella over the top of we're all trying to get better, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's that conversation within the team too. It's not just, Hey, what happened in this lesson? It's man, conferencing for me. It's still really, I just can't get to the main point. I'm still taking 12 minutes or whatever it might be. So those conversations are happening intertwined with the, daily stuff. So you hit on, you keep coming back to, and I think it is really important um, for us to talk about is that you have this great coaching culture and this great culture of perhaps like openness to vulnerability and willingness for teachers to see areas of improvement or potential improvement in themselves. So in your opinion as a teacher, what are the essential elements for building that successful culture of coaching within your school like you referenced a couple bits and pieces earlier what do we have to do in schools that don't have that already existing what makes it work um i think a lot of it has to do with 
the culture and whether that's the admin or top down or however culture is built in a school, that's such a difficult thing to kind of put your finger on, right? Like, where does it come from? But it's that it's trust. Like I would say that um, we trust our teachers, we trust each other, and I think the admin trusts teachers. So this course I keep referencing was this um, supervision and evaluation course I took at the PTC, right? It was this idea of how do we hold teachers accountable. And so much of our time in that course was talking about that idea of evaluation. And when you have a teacher who's not kind of pulling their weight, how can you identify it, call them on it, and kind of hold them responsible? And that model, just the whole time I was there, I was like, man, I'm so glad I don't work in a school like that. And I know people who are watching maybe do work at schools like that, and I get it, but that's that's a very difficult place to work because you're always kind of threatened and working at a model that you could be doing something wrong. Right. And so mm. just like students, you're not going to improve or learn anything if you feel like you have to constantly be proving yourself and feeling that your admin doesn't trust you or your department head doesn't trust you. And it becomes a bit of performance, I think, and teaching is not meant to be performance. Right. So it's always a sense of who's going to come in and am I doing the right thing? And I was talking to other leaders and I was like, that doesn't seem like a place where teachers are learning anything, you know, they're just kind of performing. So going back to that model of how do you build that trust and realizing that teachers are human beings, like they're not always going to be great. <laughs> then I think it's really that idea of the master teacher as someone who has always got it going on and they're always switched on and they know exactly what they're doing in their class. And, you know, I don't know I've had times where my class is a disaster. Like I'm in a bad mood and nothing is going well. And if anyone would walk in on that day, like if I was in a different environment, I'd be really nervous about that. But I know that if anyone walks in, they trust me enough to know that's not every day. Right. And so mm -hmm. that idea of you're putting yourself out there and saying, if I'm constantly realizing I'm not perfect, then you can get better. So I think going back to the beginning of your question, how do you do that? I think it's teachers have to feel trusted and teachers have to feel valued that what they're doing has value, even if it's not, you know, anywhere on the rubric. It's still what they're doing is a starting point. And from there, you can, you can build. I mean, you have, to, you have to believe in the idea of learning. <laughs> like you're going to learn how to do it, and it's not impossible, and you're going to get better if you just put the time and effort into it. Revolutionary. Believe in the idea of learning. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think... The, the situation that you're describing, the, the environment that you're describing is, is one that, you know, most teachers would, would relish, you know, if they're not working in that environment already that they would relish working in. Um, but I think there are also times when coaches may, or the, the coaching organization, the coaching protocols may fail or may not really work. Um, in your opinion, where does that happen? Like what, what, what are ways in which coaches or coaching fails and, and what can we do to help kind of change that? I mean, I think at the end of the day, teachers are human beings, right? And human beings are social and a lot of interesting and cool and weird and dysfunctional ways. And the way we interact with each other and the way personalities work, um, I think plays a big part. So um, here's an example for, we use, for example, the seven norms of collaboration as a way to kind of function in meetings and things like that. But I find them really, really irritating because I've been in situations where things are functional and I don't feel like we need that framework because that stuff is kind of organically happening. And like you be in a meeting and be like, what norm of collaboration are you gonna work on today? And it's like, well, I don't know. Like I gotta see what's gonna happen. I'm not gonna pick one at this point. Um, but I think, you know, some people might have to have that because it's really difficult for them to interact with people in a way that's not easygoing and organic. Or in one team, they might have that trust and that rapport, but when they're on another team, uh, it doesn't work that way. So that's, I guess, this long-winded answer. I'm trying to think my way through it. It's this idea of personalities can be one major problem. And so those personalities and relationships take time. So if a coach comes in without having built that relationship and that trust and that rapport, it kind of has an agenda and that's going to squash it pretty quickly. So I think, I guess to answer your question, some advice for coaches is you have to kind of get through the personal stuff first. I don't mean personal, like into people's business, but those personal social connections 
and then come in with the other stuff. But if you come in day one, like, hey, by the way, I have this rubric, and I think this is going to make you a better teacher. Why don't you do this? And the person's not into that, then they're going to be like, no way, like, get the hell away from me. <laughs> Sorry, I felt like that one was a little bit all over the place, but. No, I, you hit on the, I think you described the importance of personal relationships, like personal professional relationships before you start trying to like coach someone. And I think that's the getting to know the other, as a coach, getting to know the other person and understanding where they're coming from so that they see that you value and recognize their experience and you're not just coming in talking at them like a, you know, a stream of information. It's actually a conversation. So I think, I think your point is, Coaching fails when we don't see teachers as other individual human beings. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to say. See, you just paraphrased me really well. Thanks, Kim. I didn't feel like you were mocking me or parroting what I said. You got wow. to the what I was trying to say. <laughs> well done. <laughs> just pat myself on the back. Um, so thinking about like that coaching is successful when we have those relationships, what makes a coach invaluable to you? Like when are you like, oh, thank goodness I have a coach or I love this coaching thing or I'm so glad that this is available to me. Cause you talked about like perhaps some negative stories you heard over the summer. What are some positive things you can draw on? Um, again, I think that's different for every person's needs, but for me, it's just holding me accountable. Like I am a notorious procrastinator, um, very tight B big ideas. Let's try a million different things. And if they all fail, who cares? And, I think my life is very sloppy and my professional life can be really sloppy. So my coach, her personality is like super type A, like let's sit down, make some lists, let's get things organized. And just meeting with her every two weeks is like, okay, I know, you know, when Anne-Marie comes in here, I better have my stuff together or I'm going to let her down. Right. And so that's been really useful. It's just someone who's going to make sense of kind of the mess in my head and organize it for me and then let me know kind of what I need to do. So for someone else, though, it might be the opposite. And they might be someone who's super type A and they have everything organized, but they have a real hard time coming up with ideas or generating, you know, outside the box thinking. So that coach might play that role. So I think successful coaches are adaptable to kind of be the, the other, not other half, but fill a void that the coach he has. Um, and that's been really, really useful. I don't know, like one model we've done, because we kept saying, hey, JP's like in the next two weeks, you're going to work on these things, right? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. And then she'd show up and like none of it was done. So one of the models we came up with is why don't we just use that time to do that stuff? So some weeks my coach will come in and she'll just sit and kind of work in the corner and I'll be working on things we're working on. And I'll be like, hey, you know what? I'm a little bit confused on why we decided to do this or why do you think this might work out or do you have any resources? I'm kind of stuck here right now. And usually she's like, here's this reading book and this reading book. And what about this chart? You should think about this. I'm like, yeah, perfect. That's exactly what I need. And I'll piece it together and keep going. So then when she leaves, it's like, okay, like not only did I learn something, not only did we have a good conversation, I actually got that thing done. And I don't have it hanging over my head as I need to do that. So for me, that's been really useful. Of It blocks out time. Like it forces me to spend time doing something. And originally it was supposed to be time that I was supposed to carve out by myself, but I'm a bit incompetent and can't do that. So she forced me to use that time within our meeting. So that's been really good. Yeah, so I, short answer, I think coaches who are adaptable and fill the needs of their coaches, they become indispensable because you need them to kind of make your life easier and your teaching better. I really appreciate that you appreciate that coaches have to bend and, and adapt and change based on the person they're working with. Cause I think sometimes that's hard for teachers to see because you're so in your own self, you only know how you are. Like you're obviously very metacognitive and you think about yourself and you think about the way that you work with others. And you're a very reflective person, but not everybody is like that. So I think it's cool that you as a teacher can see that it is, that is something that is hard for coaches and is really highly valued by their teachers that you bend yourself to their needs as opposed to forcing everyone to fit your molds. So I think that's a really valuable point. Yeah. All right. Final question. You have had many experiences in many different schools. Was there ever a time when maybe you didn't necessarily think that coaching was valuable? And can you remember when you had that aha moment or when your perspective shifted into seeing the value of this role? And now, obviously, you think it is valuable from everything you've said today. Did you have that kind of aha moment or how did that happen for you? 
Um, I feel like, I don't know, coaching just kind of became trendy and the it word a couple of years ago. I can't name exactly when it happened, but it was, I don't know, my first couple of schools, like I don't think we ever mentioned the word coach ever. Um, and so I can't remember a time kind of of it being kind of thrust upon me or not knowing what it was. I just feel like after the last couple of years of actually working with coaches, it has been really, really, that's my aha moment, just seeing, hey, this is what it's for. It's not, I heard the term and it became kind of jargony and you hear it all over the place, but then actually having gone through it, um, it's been really useful. And then honestly, for me, another aha moment was going through learning how to be a coach myself. So I've done like eight courses or weekends of cognitive coaching and kind of gone through the whole Jedi mind trick of it. Um, and just looking at that is like, wow, there's a lot of really useful stuff. And I can see how that could be useful for the way I talk and interact with other people, also my students. And I can appreciate how other people cannot fill that role for me. So it's what I think the aha moment for me was that it's not something that is being done to me by an expert, but it's something that anybody can do at any time for someone. And really all you're doing is listening to that person and figuring out what they need and then trying to find a way to navigate them to coming up with a solution. Right? And any one of us can do that at any time because we're all professionals as opposed to like, wow, I don't know how to, because if not, then you're not coaching, you're teaching that person. I mean, like if I don't know how to do something and I go to someone and say, hey, listen, I don't know how to make an iMovie, for example, that might not necessarily be the situation where they're going to coach me through it. Like, I'll teach you how to do it. This is how you do it. Here's some things. Here's some resources. Like, don't waste hours. This is how you do this thing. Whereas coaching is more of a model of, I don't really know what I think about this or how to do it. And then the coach says, well, you're going to come up with a solution and I'm going to figure out a way to get you to come to that solution. So yeah, the aha moment is realizing that everyone is capable of coming up with solutions to their own problems. And the coach is just there to kind of make it happen. I think that's an awesome distinction, you know, uh, of the role of the coaches even kind of brings us back to that very first point of, you know, what do coaches do is the very first question. Um, it's not something that is done for people or to people. It's facilitating that, that internal dialogue externally, right. To help them name the problem or name, name the, the, the issue that they're concerned about and then come brainstorm some ideas um, and maybe you need somebody to, to come in as a, almost with that, that consultant hat to like, just say, Hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? And sometimes just asking you the right questions and getting you to tease out, Oh, actually, this is what I really, what I'm really trying to say. And this is what I'm really trying to do. Thanks. Thanks for listening to me. And then off they go. I think that's a key word, right? Like the big thing is I learned about coaching is that ability to listen and not listen waiting to say something or not listen with an agenda or not listen with solutions but actually listen to what people are saying and then help them kind of understand what they just said i really appreciate that you articulated so well the difference between coaching and consulting and i know clint has already talked about this but i think that's one thing coaches struggle with a lot of the time is and had a really good conversation with another teacher about this. Sometimes we get so ingrained in the coaching culture that teacher wants to help with iMovie and we'll sit there and like ask questions about what they already know about iMovie. And the teacher's like, look, I can have a coaching session, but please, not when I just want to know how to make an iMovie. And so like being able to flow between those two roles, even sometimes within the same like 20 minute conversation, because the iMovie learning the technical skills that I'm, we can lead you straight into the, okay, how do I get my students to demonstrate their understanding, you know, using this tool that I just learned, you know, like it all can flow together. So I think that's a really good point about coaches provide many different avenues of support for teachers and the listening and the questioning is the part that's coaching. There are other roles that we do too, but that's the kind of coaching part. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Javiz. Really appreciate the like many facets of coaching perspectives you provide for us from having done the job and also being a teacher right now and that really being your passion. So thank you very much for sharing all of that with us tonight. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for listening and having me on. <laughs> Thanks, Javiz. All right. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Clint Hamada.
and my name is Kim Cofino, and we're your hosts for this series. Between the two of us, we have almost 40 years of coaching experience in schools around the world, and we want to help you coach better. So whether you're already a coach or you're just getting started, we're passionate about helping you take that next step in your coaching journey by sharing thoughtful, professional conversations about coaching and learning with experts from around the world. And you might notice that Clint and I are never in the same room. That's because I live in Bangkok and Clint lives in Beijing. But we are so excited to get together every week to share and discuss how we can all coach better together. If you enjoy any part of this episode, please make sure you give it the old thumbs up. It really does help us to know what you want to hear more about. Also, subscribe to the channel so you can see all of the coaching videos and click on the notifications bell so you know as soon as each video gets posted. Please make sure to watch all the way to the end. We've got some great opportunities for your professional learning that we think you'll love. Let's get started.